John Cassian. We would not still be reading the Gospels or St. Paul today were it not true that the human experience of the Spirit is essentially the same at all times and in all traditions, because it is, in essence, the same encounter with the redemptive love of God in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The importance of this truth for us today is that although no one can make another's pilgrimage for him, we can nevertheless benefit from the experience and the wisdom of those who have made the pilgrimage before us. In his own day, and for his contemporaries, Jesus was seen as just such a teacher who had reached enlightenment through his fidelity and perseverance. Throughout Christian history, men and women of prayer have fulfilled a special mission in bringing their contemporaries and even succeeding generations to the same enlightenment, the same rebirth in spirit that Jesus preached. One of these teachers, John Cassian, in the fourth century, has a claim to be one of the most influential teachers of the spiritual life in the West. His special importance as the teacher and inspirer of St. Benedict, and so of the whole of Western monasticism, derives from his importance in bringing the spiritual tradition of the East into the living experience of the West. Cassian's own pilgrimage began with his own search for a teacher, for a master of prayer, a master he could not find in his own monastery in Bethlehem. Just as thousands of young people today make their pilgrimage to the East in search of wisdom and personal authority, so Cassian and his friend Germanus journeyed to the deserts of Egypt, where the holiest and most famous men of the Spirit were to be found in the fourth century. In his institutes and conferences, Cassian himself hardly comes across as a distinct personality, no more than St. Benedict does in his rule, which is so heavily indebted to John Cassian. But we do feel that we are encountering a spirit in Cassian, one which, like St. Benedict's, had achieved the object of its own teaching, the transcendence of self. Cassian's special qualities that give him such authority and directness are his capacity to listen and his gift of communicating what he has heard and made his own. It was in listening with total attention to the teachings of the holy abbot Isaac that Cassian was first fired with an enthusiasm for prayer and the firm resolve to persevere. Abbot Isaac spoke eloquently and sincerely, but, as Cassian concludes his first conference, with these words of the holy Isaac we were dazzled rather than satisfied, since we felt that though the excellence of prayer had been shown to us, Still we had not yet understood its nature and the power by which continuance in it might be gained and kept. His experience was clearly similar to that of many today, who have heard inspiring accounts of prayer, but are left uninstructed as to the practical means of really becoming aware of the Spirit praying in our heart. Cassian and Germanus humbly returned to Abbot Isaac after a few days with the simple question, How do we pray? Teach us. Show us. His answer to their question, Cassian's tenth conference, had a decisive influence on the Western understanding of prayer down to our own day. It shows, firstly, that prayer is both the acknowledgement and experience of our own poverty, our own utter dependence on God, who is the source of our being. But it is also the experience of our redemption, our enrichment by the love of God in Jesus. This twin aspect of prayer, of poverty and redemption, leads Cassian to call the condition we enjoy in prayer a grand poverty 
The mind should unceasingly cling to the mantra, Cassian writes, until strengthened by continual use of it, it casts off and rejects the rich and ample matter of all kinds of thought and restricts itself to the poverty of the single verse. Those who realize this poverty arrive with ready ease, he says, at the first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The spiritual life for Cassian, a serious perseverance in the poverty of the single verse, is a Passover. By persevering, we pass from sorrow to joy, from loneliness to communion. And unlike many of the Egyptian ascetics who saw mortification as an end in itself, Cassian clearly teaches that it is merely a means to an end, and that that end is the unbroken awareness of the life of the Spirit, continually renewing us, giving new life to our mortal bodies. Similarly, he sees the religious community as a means of leading each individual to an awareness of his communion with all in Jesus. And just as the mantra is the sacrament of our poverty in prayer, so in the community, absolute honesty and frankness in your relationships with one another, and above all with your teacher, is the sign and means of making the Passover from fear to love. One of his recurrent themes is the absolute importance of personal verification. We must know for ourselves, in the depth of our own being. We must perform rather than teach, be rather than do. Above all, we must be fully awake to the wonder and beauty of our being, to the mystery of the personal life of Jesus in our heart, and we must relentlessly avoid the pitfall of half-consciousness, the drowsy state of what he calls pernicious peace, pax perniciosa, a lethal sleep, the sopa letalis. His importance as a teacher in our own day is his simplicity and directness. His are noble sentiments inspiring ideals. But how do we fulfill the command of Jesus to stay awake and pray? Cassian brought the answer to the West from the ancient tradition of Christian prayer. By knowing ourselves to be poor and by deepening in prayer our experience of poverty in complete self-renunciation. A simple, practical means, he teaches, is the unceasing use of the mantra. The Christian, he wrote, has as his principal aim the realization of the kingdom of God, the power of the Spirit of Jesus in his heart. But we cannot get this by our own efforts or think our way into it. And so we have a simpler, more immediate goal, which he calls purity of heart. And this is all we should concern ourselves with, he teaches. The rest will be given to you. And the way to purity of heart, to full, clear awareness, is the way of poverty, the grand poverty of the mantra.